So, warm welcome to uh, our two guests, Philip Baumann from Ecosia, the search engine that plants trees, and Roman Meyer Andre from uh, TÜV Nord. So before we start, I'll briefly ask you to introduce yourself, and then I'll start with the first question. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Very excited to be here. It's a gorgeous location. Um, very quick introduction. So my name's Philip, and uh, I work for Ecosia for about three years now. The company exists for about nine, nine and a half years. It's a German company located here in Berlin, about 40 employees at the moment. And we're a social business. We are uh, Germany's, maybe even Europe's first B corporation, if you know that. And we're also, since last year, um, part of the Purpose Foundation, which means that the company cannot be sold and it can only be owned by employees. Our product is the search engine that plants trees. Sounds funny. Uh, it's very simple, very simple to use. You can try it out. It's basically like Google or other search engines. But the big difference is that we use the majority of our revenues to finance tree planting projects around the world. So far, we've planted, with the help of our over 8 million users, over 60 million trees in over 21 countries. And my hope is that I can give a little bit of inspiration tonight by showing that it is actually possible that you can have a company that has a purpose and that achieves real, lasting positive impact in the world. Yeah, hello, my name is Roman Meyer Andre. I'm from TÜV Nord, which is a little bit older company from uh, Germany. Uh, we're having our 150th anniversary this year, actually. So for the last 150 years, we kind of maintained the value of making li people's lives a little bit safer and also helping people to adopt technology, right? So we are technologists, we're engineers, and we understand technology so that it becomes more safer to use for people in various um, branches. I'm personally um, running the IT and digitalization of the mobility arm, which is obviously the most well-known part of the classical TÜV, the vehicle testing, inspection, and certification part. Thank you. When I hear about TÜV Nord Mobilität, you know, I mean, maybe for the foreigners um, here, TÜV is uh, the yeah, inspection organization that puts you a sticker onto your car as far as it's allowed to be running on the streets, and they take away the sticker uh, when it's not allowed to run there anymore, right? So it's, uh, yeah, as you said, engineers, um, I would imagine very rational people, right? They... Uh, go by the checklist, they go by the forms, and uh, there's no arguing about it, right? So um, if we talk about values, I mean, does, do values play a role in such an environment and such an organization at all in the first place? Yeah, so I mean, as I mentioned also in the start, I mean, we are basically coming from making the world a safer place, right? So that's kind of the core value where some industry people got together 150 years ago to, to make uh, steam engines safe, right? Because they ex tended to explode, which wasn't good. So um, what they did is they said, okay, we need some third party, some independent third party who inspects these steam engines and makes them safe and secure. And over the past 150 years, there has been more and more uh, other fields that we were starting to inspect and look into. And so that seems to be a theme that persists yeah, throughout uh, the time, probably. Um, and now, so this is what we call kind of the regulated market, where you, where you kind of um, inspect things that, that are given by, by law or legislation. What we see more and more, more nowadays is basically um, the notion of also security, as in IT security, for instance, which is a largely different field to classical inspecting safety, um, and also trust in a, in a free market, where we are the trusted third party who lends our brand and our image to uh, a third party as a third party 
to uh, marketplaces such as used used car marketplaces or so, where it's about the v value of your vehicle, for instance. Yeah, who can you trust that you get a fair uh, share, a fair amount of money for your car? So that's also what where where we're in more and more these days. Okay, so as I hear, values of originally safety from the regulated market, then security and trust as an enabler of uh, yeah new technology adoption for customers, right? Let's uh, look into Ecosia. So um, I know you have a strong set of six core values that you intend to comply with, I assume. Uh, why was it important to have these values in place from the beginning and how do they affect the way you develop your business and your business model? So about over three, three and a half years ago when I joined, we had a set of core values. I can't exactly remember what they were at the time, but we went, briefly after I joined, we went through an iteration of those. And as you said, it was very much bottom up. So we took some time to reflect on them, to share what is important to us, to share why are we here, why are we giving our time and energy to this place, to this organization. Um, and then distilled with, it was quite a difficult process as well to boil it down into this like six core values that fit on one, on one page. And to be perfectly honest, I'm not entirely sure why we did it. I think it was just a sense of uh, a lot of things are happening every day, especially in a small scale startup that we were at that time. So we need some guiding light. We need something that we can come back to every now and then to look at and, and see, are we still on track? Are all the opportunities that are around us, all the things we're doing, all the activities day to day, are they still in line basically? The way we're interacting with each other, the way we're interacting with our users, the way we're interacting with the people in the countries where we're planting. So I think it was just a sense of we need a, a frame, a guiding light that we, we can use. And did that actually ever happen? That someone that you were um, having a discussion or um, a gate, uh, so to say, uh, and where someone said, well, interesting idea, but actually that's completely against everything we stand for, so let's not do it? Yes, so to be, to be honest, mo the, it's mostly used, uh, or it's used a lot in hiring and onboarding. So we do, uh, when, we, when we hire a new person, we make the core values public and we also discuss them in the interviews. And we also talk a lot about them in the onboarding. And then afterwards, I would say they're now so ingrained in the way we think and work that we don't specifically refer to them often, but it happens sometimes. So I can, can remember we have one of our values is users first, and it talks about uh, making sure that we always act in the user's best interest and that we respect their time, their intent, and their privacy. And there were cases where um, there were business interests or there were interests from technology or from stakeholders um, and then it's very good, especially for people who work in product, to have this core value to point to and be, no, we want to make sure we put the user's interest first. Oh, we don't know what the user's interests are? Well, let's find out. So these cases happen, yes. And Roman, uh, you're responsible for a lot of the innovation projects taking place in TÜV Nord Mobilität. How, um, if you're looking into the future, if you're working towards the next generation services you're uh, intending to offer, how do values uh, or even considerations of sustainability impact that uh, these kind of developments? Yeah, I guess it's twofold. I mean, on the, on the one hand, what you obviously have is the inspector, right? The typical employee is an inspector or a certifier. Um, and he typically doesn't wake up in the morning and uh, thinks about... Uh, failing fast and, and, you know, iterating and all these things that we are now trying to implement much more. Uh, speaking of design thinking, which you referred to earlier. Um, so we really need to live this culture and establish a culture where you can fail in a, in a safe way, in a safe environment, right? Where it's, where it's good, actually, to fail and to learn from that. So this is kind of a, a step for us, I guess, from our culture. Um, and then, on the other hand, as we are kind of 
the result of a almost societal demand, right? Our right of existence comes from that, is that also these um, these values of society change, as you can tell, right? From the from the diesel scandal, for instance, or from from other things around automotive, where you see that um, we are much more cognizant of these developments. So we are influencing, uh, in our sense, of course, how regulation tomorrow will look like and what will we do, actually, to certify and to inspect. And obviously, the big question is how will those changed values also in society uh, affect this uh, regulation and these innovations moving forward where we provide new services that kind of pay into these changing demands because that's kind of where we're, where we're coming from and that's what we have to cater to, right? So on both sides, regulatory but also, um, as I said, in this unregulated market where we are thinking of also implementing um, certain uh, of the SDGs, for instance, into our strategy, which is now uh, 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 an ongoing process, which we're starting right now. Maybe just to add to one thing you said, which I think is very true, your average employee doesn't wake up in the morning and has the core values above their bed and thinks about them all day. And the other key thing that we found over the last years, apart from hiring, where you can really build culture around core values, is um, by living a good example. So if you have a few people in the organization, especially the ones in leadership positions, who live them by example and who also, what kind of behavior they criticize or they praise is actually one of the most efficient ways of actually um, building that culture and establishing these values. It's not so much about presenting them and talking about them, it's actually what kind of actions you do, what kind of decisions you do. If you have a strategic decision ahead of you and everyone in the organization is gonna look very closely at what that decision is and if it's in line with the core values or not. And that impacts them a lot more. Yep. So, yeah. Okay, I think that's very good to understand for the employee values and the management values and that you have to so, show some integrity in what you're doing. Um, since you're talking about societal values that are changing, how do you know how they are changing? Do you read the news or do you talk to the people or how do you go about doing that? So that's what I mentioned earlier, right? This, this phase where you have this perfect circle of regulation, legislation, standardization probably. That's a lengthy, very lengthy circle, right? So that's, that takes years, most of the time. What's much more immediate is, um, I, I just yesterday looked it up, every day in the mobility arm, we're in 7,000 different locations. So our employees are basically in 7,000 locations every day, working with the customers and um, um, talking to them and experiencing their service because our product is a service, right? So we, we get very, uh, immediate feedback from um, what people think about what we do. And on top of that, obviously, um, I found over my last uh, years of working, actually, that um, thorough research of ethnographic research or behavioral research is uh, really of very big value as it um, puts the problem in the center of, of, of the analysis and not so much the uh, looking for a solution. So I, I, I think oftentimes, although you're a 150-year-old company and you tend to know you know everything, right? Um, it's almost always the twists or the, the changes that you don't see um, and where you really have to go um, into the field really openly, probably not even us ourselves, but somebody else who goes in with a, with a fresh view uh, with a beginner's mind, right, and looks into this very complicated environment and then comes back and says, yeah, you, you were right in a, in a way, but it has a twist to it or things have changed or look deeper here, right? So this proved to be really, really valuable in the past. Yeah, so we have um, some <clears throat> methods how to manage values, how to explore values in the organization, leading by examples, uh, doing field research. So I want to ask you, uh, which 
challenges have you been facing in your organizations in trying to uh, yeah, implement certain values? Uh, which measures have you encountered? Um, or do you have any question that you want to ask uh, our industry representatives here? Yeah, please. Can you come up and join us here? So we have a beautiful old chair here for uh, our participants. And please briefly just introduce your name and uh, yeah, hello, I'm uh, Marlene. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm a professor in sustainable finance and accounting. And my question is, you mentioned that you were a B Corp, B Corporation, and you have your own values. So B Corporation has their own values for which they, de they developed for several uh, companies. So how do you balance your own values and the values that the B Corp is expecting from you? Good question. Um, I think in the end our own values matter more, so, honestly. So um, we got the B Corp certification because it was something we wanted to support. I think there is a need around the world for something that is in between a pure for-profit organization as we know it um, and the non-profits that we know today. And I think there's really a need in between. I think eventually my, my hope, my dream is that every company will actually have a purpose that goes beyond making money. And we saw B Corp as one step in that direction. So we wanted to support it. It also gives a little bit of credibility to us, especially in the US. You, you know about certifications and credibility, right? Um, so we do the audit every year and we are also send questions around in the company when we do the audit and we let people who work at Ecosia rate ourselves along the lines of B Corp. Um, but what is much closer to us and much more important to us are the values that we established ourselves because the, they come from us. I, but there, so far there hasn't also luckily been any big conflict between the two. Thank you, but it's, uh, I think, a very interesting general discussion, right, about like normative systems that you want to certify with uh, and the individual values, as we said in the beginning. I mean, they have to grow bottom up and are as unique as every bunch of employees is, right? And this is the reason why they have the, these potentials, uh, I would say, in the first place, because they are really incorporated by the uh, people working at the spot, right? Okay, anyone else who wants to join us? Thank you very much. Anyone else having a question or comment to contribute? Great, warm welcome. Uh, thank you, hi, my name is Stephen Curtis. I'm a PhD student at Lund University. I am studying sustainable business models in the sharing economy. But my question has nothing to do with that. Um, in fact, one of the things that I recognize in academia is oftentimes we as a department don't have the time to talk about our values. And of course, values are important in, in how we work in academia, but of course, in how you work as well. I'm curious if you have any advice for other organizations or in particular academic departments and how to make time to meaningfully talk about values um, among your empl employees. Well, as, as is the case with values themselves, I think you should see the value in the time to make it. Otherwise, nobody will, will take the time for it. So if, if you find w the reason why, why, we, why should we be doing it, and maybe paint the picture of, of what it could do for us in the future, right? We tend to work with visions and normative visions and explorative visions, but what always helps is thinking about from the end, right? What will it have brought us if we have had this discussion, hypothetically? And then typically, you get more understanding of that it's not a very theoretical discussion, but it has very practical consequences in everyday life. And that typically tends to convince people who are not, uh, I would say, thinking about that every morning, right? Because it's not a topic for every morning. It's just a topic you have to dive into it a little bit, and you have to understand a little bit around what you want to achieve with it. But thinking from the end typically helps me and my colleagues a lot when we think about how can we make a change that, that is impactful. Yeah. Yeah. 
we have that struggle as well, or we had that, and it's always the struggle, like what is urgent and important, and what is important but not urgent, right? And yeah, the, the perfect future state helps a lot. Uh, what also I just want to add to you, I think um, not everyone needs to be equally involved. So yes, ideally it's really a sh collaborative, shared exploration and effort, but some people just tend to think more on that level and like to engage with that level, and some people less, and that's fine. At least for us it was fine. Sometimes it's really collaborative, sometimes it's more consultative. So just making the process flexible and putting in little chunks here and there, and then as well making it very specific, giving very specific examples of how would you answer this question? Would you work with this partner or not? Why not? What value does that relate to? Write it down, you already have a draft. Done. So trying to make it small and flexible so people can accommodate in their daily work life. Uh, good, thanks for your reflections. I just have to say from my experience, as you've said, I mean, I think as a young researcher, uh, kind of trying to challenge uh, this, uh, the way that we work in academia sometimes, it's important for us to discuss our values. And, and I wonder, like, uh, it sounds like your experience is that uh, discussions about values can happen both at the top, but also from the bottom. Um, and sometimes there are leaders who don't necessarily want to have those discussions about values. Uh, so maybe I'd guess I'd take away from this is that we as young researchers can also have an impact in how we discuss values in our organization. And it sounds like that's something that also happens in yours or organizations as well. Great, thanks for your reflections. Okay, thank you very much. Who else is there with a question or a comment? Yeah, please. Hi, nice to meet you. My apologies if you have talked about that issue already. It's a bit complicated to understand it. However, my question would be like you're sitting now in the front of a couple of international researchers who do work on uh, sustainability and business models. And I would like to uh, know from you what you expect from us. So what would be helpful for you to further continue your work um, in the way as you plan to continue with it? All right, it's your job, right? <laughs> Wow, um, so maybe just what the last question was, right? Sometimes you have to prove the value of investing time into creating values for your organization. So if you can have a couple of articles, a couple of very brief summaries of why this is valuable, with very specific examples, um, you can send that to the right people. I think it really helps evangelizing for making time for these things. Um, first thought that comes to my mind. Yeah, for me, it also goes back a little bit to this idea of almost an algorithm for implementing things, right? So kind of this thinking fast and slow thing, right? Where in daily, daily work, in a business environment, it's not always easy to ask the hard questions and to really thoroughly analyze them and think them through. So any advice, any, any help that kind of it can give a leeway into how to actually implement them, how to make things actionable, I think is, is highly critical um, because the idea is almost, it's, it's overwhelming, Henning stated it, right? It's a lot how to prioritize and methods, tools, um, standardization helps a lot here, I guess. Uh, not, not to paint it black and white, right? Not to be too stereotyping on things, but to really give uh, something at hand that can be used um, to, to develop something that's meaningful. And that is the hardest part in, in daily business life, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I have one more idea, maybe a little bit more ambitious, but um, to me, I would personally argue that if you have a strong purpose for your organization that goes beyond uh, creating shareholder value, this is a competitive advantage. It's easier to attract talent, it's easier to build services and products that are viable and sustainable also economically in the long run, um, and you're just building a more solid business in the end. Um, that's my theory, I don't know if anyone has proven it yet, um, but that would be great, I think, yeah, to prove that. Yeah, okay, so I'll uh, ask 
our participants here uh, for a final statement. For you, it's the final chance to contribute your own question or statement up front. Um, otherwise, yeah, I'll hand over to Philip Baumann. Um, so I'm going to be around if you have more questions as well. I know it, this looks a bit intimidating, maybe. Um, yeah, what, what I just can say from personal experience is that, to me, it made a huge, huge difference starting uh, to work at an organization that, that has this purpose and that manifests this positive change in the world. And I think what could really help is if more people can experience that. I know that already more and more people are looking for this, um, but if more people can experience that, I think it would be wonderful. And so I just want to encourage all of you to look for these opportunities. They can be big or small, and, and to try it out and see for yourself. Um, yeah, and of course, also within the organization you are in right now, at a recent uh, event, someone asked me, well, should everyone join Ecosia? And I said, no, I don't think this is a good idea. Not everyone should join the B Corps, the purpose uh, companies that are out there. We need motivated, passionate people in the, let's say, more traditional organizations because they are the seed for change in there. And even though it might sometimes feel very hard and tedious and so many organizational structures that are maybe blocking you, I would look for these opportunities how you can ask these questions. What, what are we really trying to achieve with this? Is it just about making money? Is there a deeper goal here? What will this be in 10, 20, 50 years from now? What will this be if everyone on the planet would do it? Would it still work? Would it still be good for everyone? Ask these questions and see what comes and, and maybe you can start creating a little bit of change as well. I'm sure of it. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think um, when you look at the development, even in the past couple of years, that business models change a lot, uh, um, technologies change faster than you can tell, and um, what really sticks, and this is also what, what I see in more and more organizations, having worked for a couple, um, that the, the core values of whatever the company stands for are getting more and more in the center of focus. So now is the time, absolutely the time for driving these initiatives and making them actionable, tangible for people and, and guiding them a little bit on the way because most of, I mean, especially companies that are probably very old or older, they, they used to be built on a foundation, on a almost a, a myth or a legend, right? Uh, how they have been founded, and oftentimes through efficiency and so on, that has been lost. Um, but to really uh, dig deeper on that and say, hey, that's, that's what you stood for anyways, always, all the time. We just need to uncover it anew and refresh it. Um, I think that's a very valuable approach, and this is exactly the right time to do that. Okay, so thank you very much, everybody. Thanks to uh, our participants. Thanks to the fish from the audience. And hope you have a very wonderful and personally enriching and inspiring conference over the next two and a half days. Thank you.